Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Maggie Moran with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. In about a week following the webinar, we'll be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. Please be patient as the post-webinar preparation of materials can take some time. Our speakers for today's program are Bill Foster, Director of Business Development of Healthcare at Spectralink, Paul Hubbard, Director of Nursing for Neurosciences and Behavioral Health at AnMed Health, and Courtney Govro, CEO and founder of Sphere 3. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Bill to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you to the Becker organization for hosting this webinar. I really also want to thank you, the participants, for taking time out of your busy day to take part in this conversation to kind of better understand how the deployment of an effective mobile communication solution and help drive better outcomes. We will be covering a few key components for deploying a unified communication and workflow platform. We know this is basically just the tip of the iceberg, but we hope that the insights shared today will create conversation and help move the needle for you and your organization. I will start by covering the first two topics of clinical mobility trends and share some key goals for what we believe is an effective mobile communication strategy. I will then turn it over to Paul Hubbard to share his experience of actually deploying a complex communication platform at AnMed Health in South Carolina. And that'll be followed by Courtney Gavro from Sphere 3, who will tackle the complex component of measuring mobility success and how some of the key components and metrics to help you measure the success of your mobility solution. Again, please feel free to enter questions in the question box, and we will be sure to cover those at the end of this formal presentation. Next slide, please. I wanna make a couple quick comments. If you go back, go back to the slide, actually. Uh, the title states that it's a proven prescription for collaboration success. I want to focus in on that word collaboration. One of the things I first did is that, let's look that up. It's a noun. It's the action of working with someone to produce or create something. You think about it, it's synonymous with teamwork, partnership, association, relationship. So collaboration and communication really goes hand in hand, and it occurs when two or more people in an organization work together to realize or achieve a goal. So collaboration is very similar to cooperation and teams that are able to collaborate together obtain greater success. So two quick factoids as well from our friends at Spyglass Consulting is that 47%, 47% of hospitals have already deployed smartphone-based communication platforms enterprise-wide, but 90% of these hospitals are also evaluating incremental investments over the next 18 months. So they see the value of how smartphones and clinical communication grows. Also, 73% of hospitals have deployed a middleware platform to integrate with hospital IT infrastructure, biomedical devices, and other clinical information systems to support data-driven closed-loop communication. So smartphone deployment and middleware is key to collaboration. So next slide, please. So what do clinicians want? What do they need in a mobile device? It's a long list, but we're gonna narrow it down to just the first few, right? So in, with secure communications, it needs to work inside and outside the hospital networks because it's not just the four walls of the hospital and it's not just a single hospital, but it's a whole network and infrastructure and ecosystem. You need to be able to support the sharing of files and images. And you know, at the end of the day too, it's really got to be a durable device that withstand the rigors of the clinical environment and, and with a long battery life and those types of things that go along with a clinical device. Smart alarms and alerts with patient monitoring. You've got to integrate with, again, different hospital systems, different personnel within the organization, other devices, 
and be able to send critically the right alarm to the right person at the right time and be able to address critical needs such as national patient safety goals for reducing alarm fatigue. Being able to integrate with your electronic health record. Integration is key to your EHR vendor, uh, you know, applications such as Epic Rover, and have the capability to have high quality barcode scanners and or cameras to facilitate this. Easy access to medical reference apps. You need to have some internet access to certain hospital endorsed sources that you can have at your fingertips. And finally, facilitate task management. Integrate with other systems. Integrate with nurse call, lab results, critical alerts, messaging, email, and so on. Next slide. You know, if you think about it first, you know, the care of patients now is almost inevitably seems to involve many different individuals, all needing to share patient information and discuss their management. As a consequence, there is increasing interest in and the use of information and communication technologies to support these services. Indeed, if information is the lifeblood of healthcare, then communication is the heart that pumps it. In this slide, brought on by a survey conducted by Spoke, is that some key goals for mobility strategies, what areas of the organization you're looking to improve? And you can see on here between a stated goal as well as the act that's part of the mobility strategy as well as the actual stated goal is that physician to physician communication, nurse to physician communication, nurse to nurse communication, then you have your code team, your rapid response teams, and then communication with systems of networking physicians and other health professionals. So you can see how all of these start to manifest themselves and basically multiply and why the communication platform has to be designed and deployed to take all these factors into consideration. Next slide, please. So clinical communication and, and collaboration. One of the reasons um, for clinical communication is sharp contrast to the inefficient clinical workflows characterized by disjointed paging, phone calls that still exist in healthcare settings today. The implementation of effective clinical communication and collaboration systems has proven to assist healthcare providers in responding to meaningful use mandates and improving care quality measures and patient satisfaction scores. This, uh, this includes clinical communication systems that have gained traction due to the increased use of mobile devices at the point of care and a focus on care quality, care coordination, and the patient experience. We also see healthcare CIOs and clinical leadership have begun to deploy clinical communication collaboration platforms for more widely, more widely in an effort to better coordinate care, improve outcomes, and help reduce readmission rates, which as we know, it can be really costly to a hospital. I believe CCNC will become a critical point of care system as a healthcare provider transform into a real-time health system, facilitating interactive patient care, action alarm notification and alerts. Next slide. So what are the clinical mobility requirements? Well, unified cross-platform tools, tools that support different devices anytime, anywhere. You also need enterprise-wide directories and on-call databases that integrate so you know who to contact, who's part of this patient's care team, and how do I contact that person at the touch of a finger. Event-driven communications providing actionable content, analytics, and reporting tools to help measure effectiveness and drive workflow improvements. You know what they say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And you also must be supportive of your privacy and security policies, administrative safeguards, and technical controls for HIPAA compliance. Very critical from an IT standpoint also to make sure is this, the, are, is this solution easy to manage, easy to troubleshoot, easy to, so, to support? Next slide. From a mobility value proposi proposition, you know, the beauty of implementing an integrated communication solution with smartphones is the value proposition of a well-defined and well-executed communication solution. Clinicians see the benefits of collaborating with the entire care team and how it can positively influence patient safety 
and the patient experience, along with care team productivity and employee satisfaction, which leads to the healthcare provider's ability to manage patient throughput and capacity, workflow optimization, and incidence response and disaster preparedness. Really, I call this the trifecta of benefits to the healthcare organization. What I mean by that is that you're gonna be able to reduce healthcare costs, improve care quality and outcomes, and increase patient and staff satisfaction. That's based on a study by Gartner, by the way. Next slide. Do a polling question. Establishing a mobility strategy. So with your device, please answer this question. Do you have a defined mobility strategy in place? Okay, so you can see here the results are starting to come in and 69% do not have a defined mobility strategy in place and 31% said yes. So there's some, some work to do and some interesting uh, concepts around that in terms of what can I benefit? What do I get? So it's doing some, uh, some legwork to understand how this all comes, in, comes together. So hopefully some of the comments made today by uh, this, our panel will, will help you with that. So next slide, please. So thinking about it, what areas are you looking to actually optimize? You know, are you looking to help support the apps of, of your mobile device, integration to your electronic health records? We want to make sure we're focusing on noise reduction and infection control. If you think about some of the outcomes of the clinical environment, it's nurse efficiency. You know, rarely is there an industry where you're asked to go to work every day and do more with less every single day. It's a tough position to be a clinician in a hospital environment. But you can do that through improved communication, through improved care coordination, through improved efficiencies with that patient. And then at the same time, you're able to reduce or uh, better manage your operational costs because of the delivery of these special apps to nurses to help them do their jobs and do so that is, is HIPAA compliant and maintaining the sanctity of patient health information. So. You know, one of the things that we do at SpectreLink is we make sure we help healthcare providers achieve these key objectives in a variety of we ways. You know, the items noted above there are key areas that SpectreLink currently helps many hospitals and other provider achieve, providers achieve positive results with their patients and their business. Next slide. So kind of wrapping it up from my standpoint is a healthcare communication platform. You know, what are the components? You know, you're looking to deploy a communication platform and it starts with the right device. So you want to be able to support all members of the care team. You want to make sure that you're providing and maintaining a single web-based directory. You want to support multiple devices. Not everybody's going to have a hospital issued mobile device. You're going to have that bring your own type, bring your own device smartphone. You may still have pagers, you may still have walkie talkies. You need to be able to integrate all of these communication devices. You need to integrate with other third party systems, deliver emergency notifications and, and you know, provide an audit trail so you know where all this came from. So you know, that's again, looking at where Spectrum comes in and we've developed some purpose built clinical smartphones to deliver that high quality voice via Wi-Fi or cellular. We integrate barcode scanning, cameras, hot swappable batteries, all wrapped up into a consumer style phone, but rugged to meet the rigors of healthcare. So I encourage you to look at the uh, new Versity smartphone from SpectraLink and uh, take a look at some of the other devices that we offer to help you. I'm now gonna turn this over to Paul Hubbard, uh, as you heard, he's the Director of uh, Neurosciences and Behavioral Health at AnMed Health to share with you some of his insights into deploying a clinical collaboration solution. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick background on myself in terms of the process and by which we came to where we're at today at AnMed Health. Um, about four years ago, I was special projects coordinator and uh, my CNO came to me and said, we need to replace the nurse call system. So that began our, our essentially our mobile device strategy in terms of ensuring that whatever uh, hardware or software we put in place 
was compatible with the next generation of whatever device that may come on the market. So from the beginning, we were very cognizant of the fact that we needed to make sure that we had state-of-the-art and that state-of-the-art was compatible moving forward with any new devices or new hardware and software that came out. So next slide, a little bit about AMED Health. Uh, we have a little bit more than 461 acute, acute care beds. Uh, we on three campuses. We have uh, a medical center campus downtown Anderson, and then we have our North Campus, which is our women's and children's and procedural campus, and then we own a, another hospital uh, in a separate county from us. So we have three facilities uh, that encompass about 480 beds. Uh, we provide a wide range of services, open heart surgery, trauma, medicine, stroke. Um, we're doing TAVR now, and we're also doing uh, placing watchmen. So we're hopefully on the cutting edge of uh, our cardiovascular heart, open heart surgery initiatives. So our project objectives from the beginning were a unified mobile solution that uh, was easy to use uh, so that we could have better collaboration, collaboration across teams, which including our physicians and our ancillary departments. And we wanted to make sure that that objective was met to improve efficiencies as well for our staff. Next slide. So when we started looking at mobile devices, uh, which was a couple of years ago, uh, we wanted to make sure that our end users were on board with what we were going to purchase. So we were able to bring devices in. We brought several devices in, allowed staff to handle the devices, play with the devices, uh, set them up so that they can understand and see how they would work. And of course, an Android device or an Apple device, iOS device, are ones that most people are familiar with nowadays. So they need to be thin, lightweight, and easy to carry, obviously. They need to have large screens so that uh, they could see uh, alerts and messages easily. Uh, the, the biggest thing for me was a single sign-on for day-to-day -day healthcare apps, and that was making sure that the workflow of the staff member at the bedside was uninterrupted, that uh, when they signed in, they were able to get all their messages, all their alarms, and everything else from that point forward without having to sign into multiple applications. So they were they need to be able to access data and teams and information and moving forward with our secure texting uh, platform, we ensured that high performance throughout the entire shift. Obviously, we needed a, a device that uh, would last 12 hours at least so that uh, your battery didn't go dead in the middle of the shift. And then we wanted to make sure that whatever our design was, it fit with the existing workflow, that we don't change the workflow uh, at all. The IT requirements, and we had a, a multidisciplinary team from the beginning that included IT, the executive team, uh, and nurses, nursing staff. Uh, but the IT requirements were, of course, high quality of service for both voice and data. Uh, access to enterprise systems and tools had to be reliable, obviously. And then the durability uh, is kind of, um, across the board, both end user and IT requirements. We didn't want to have to purchase you know, new devices every three or four months. And then we wanted to make sure that access is completely controlled by IT, so we run a uh, device management system on that. Next slide. It's kind of a visualization of our enterprise mobility uh, system. And it starts, of course, with the device itself at the bedside. It's in the hands of the nurse, especially pivot phones. We have a middleware. We use Connexol. And then we have that integrated with our Philips alarms, our uh, Volt secure texting, and then our Epic with patient records. And we also have our nurse call in there that's missing, which is a, a GE uh, nurse call telergy system. Next slide. Just an example of one of the workflows uh, that we have in place. As I log in for the day, uh, assignments are done in Connexol. So when I log in as a nurse, I have the access to every staff member on my home screen for my unit. I can also go to any unit in the hospital and find a staff member in that unit. So if I search for ED, I can find the nurse that is going to send me a patient that needs to call report. I can text her and tell her I'm ready to get the, the um, report, the patient report. So, so instead of having somebody call and say, hey, I need to speak to Paul, 
and give report. The secretary says, oh, let me find them. And then you're put on hold forever. So it just makes that much more efficient in terms of being able to find the nurse and staff that are taking care of patients that you have questions about. Um, this specifically is for the ED, but we use it across many different um, areas of the hospital, ancillary departments as well. Next slide. And just repeating what I said there at the bottom. Um, this is, we currently have nurse call alerts routes directly to patient care staff. So in Phillips, we have alarms that come out. I think that's the next slide, but in terms of uh, patient placement, we have a centralized patient placement that places patients in specific rooms based on orders by the physician. They can in turn notify any of those ancillary departments and even physicians to discuss with them issues with the patient or just inform them that the patient is going to a specific room. They can inform the admitting physician that the patient is, is ready for orders so that the physician, all they have to do is pick up their phone, their personal phone, see the text, log into Epic and put their orders in so that they know the patient is ready to have orders placed on. Operating room uh, efficiencies are communication between surgery, uh, PACU, and the receiving floor. Admitting staff are notified through Volt uh, and devices that they have a patient ready to be uh, admitted, bring the paperwork, the, the uh, ID bracelets, and so forth. Our pharmacy uses it for our antibiotic stewardship in terms of going through the chart, making sure the antibiotic is appropriate for the patient, uh, for the culture that came back, notifying the physician via um, mobile device, and then letting them know yes or no. So you're able to be all tracked in one place. One person has access to every other person that's logged in, whether they're a physician, pharmacist, primary staff nurse, or person in surgery, admitting, respiratory therapy, lab, et cetera. Next slide. Example of our current monitoring, we have a centralized monitoring system that monitors all of our patients in the hospital, EKG monitor. Uh, we have it set up that um, there is a 30-second uh, delay on all alarms that come through um, the, the centralized telemetry room. So the monitor tech is watching the patients, um, and then the alarm comes through. And if it's a if it's an alarm like a low battery or um, a lead off, those kinds of things, that tech has the ability with their device to text the nurse taking care of that patient or the nursing assistant if it's just a battery or a lead. If it's a red alarm, they allow that to go through. It passes through um, to Volt, to the Spectral Link Pivot, and alarms uh, on their phone. They can then uh, receive that alarm, and it records the fact that they have received the alarm and um, noted that they have, have received it. So they go, of course, and check on the patient. Um, that is, is happening today and is, is, is very efficient in terms of not passing through every alarm that comes through for alarm fatigue for our, for our staff at our bedside. Next slide. And this is just a, a, an example, again, of the alarm passing through. If it's a red alarm, um, the nursing staff receives it on their device. They're able to see it exactly as it's um, configured in the Philips alarm system, so there's no change. If they were at their their monitor at the desk, at the nurse's desk, they'd see the same exact alarm. And then they're able to acknowledge that and, of course, go check on the patient. Next slide. Thank you, Paul. That's uh, great information. And if I may, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions as follow-up, if I could. Sure. Uh, one is you stated that ANMED wanted to make sure that workflows were not disrupted or changed by technology, but instead you needed a solution that worked the other way or the, the way the staff works. Why is this important and how did you make that happen? Well, it's important for two reasons. Number one, uh, adoption by frontline staff. Uh, the more you affect the workflow, I think the less the adoption is going to take place. And nurses and staff and, well, all ancillary personnel, anybody taking care of patients these days, 
have a workflow that works for them. So if we go in and try to change that workflow or disrupt that workflow, uh, I think they're going to be less likely to adopt it. They're not going to be happy about it. And then as well as the fact that we have competing priorities today. In healthcare, uh, 20 years ago when I was a nurse in ICU, we were taught to prioritize our patient care. So we would go in, assess our patient, have 10 things that we needed to do during our shift. And the top one was usually make sure the patient lived. But nowadays, there may be two or three priorities in that top number one category. I mean, we, have, we, we are forcing our nurses to, to make sure that they're providing high quality care, that patient, patient satisfaction experience is, is out of the roof, that we wash our hands every time we walk into a room. There's so many different competing priorities that we have to make sure that we don't cause a disruption in their workflow so that they're more likely to, to adopt and use the, um, the process itself. And then how we wanted to make sure that we had buy-in from, from our staff. So we had demonstrations of all the possible devices um, that we were looking at. And of course, they had to fit the IT requirements. Once they went through that IT requirement, we had two or three devices that we had examples of where staff could come in, clinical staff, and touch them and feel them and work with them and look at them and then um, make sure that they were they liked the device. As a matter of fact, they chose the device. Uh, we left that up to them. Once it meets the IT requirements, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter too much uh, about what device they choose. So once they chose that device, that's the device we went with. And, you know, the decision to build should be controlled by workflow. Uh, the workflow uh, and not built by, and not controlled by the build. So. Great, thank you for that. You know, and as a follow-up, you mentioned, uh, you know, the whole IT as well as clinical. So when it comes to deploying a clinical communication platform, you need to have the IT team partner with the clinical team. So what did you do at ANMED to make sure the clinical requirements were communicated correctly or actively to the IT team? And how did that affect the outcome? Well, we had, we had open communication from the onset. We had a team of, of people that included IT, clinical, management, and even executive team members. So as we started the process of looking at what devices and what middleware and, and software and, and the flows that we wanted to, to put out there, it was a, a collaborative between all those uh, different departments. And uh, without executive buy-in, you really can't sell it to anybody else. And with executive buy-in, obviously you have a little bit more um, oomph in, in terms of putting it out to the staff. And, and, and then with the staff, basically telling you we want this device and this is the device we chose and you are allowed to by executive team to purchase that device it helps the entire process of collaboration so we established the list of needs and requirements from the clinical team and then we communicated to the uh, IT team those needs and then we established the needs and requirements from the IT team and we um, communicated those to the clinical team That's great. That's uh, that's the way it should work. Uh, I have one more question for you, Paul. Is one of the more difficult challenges we've seen in deploying mobility solutions is really getting the staff to use the devices and take advantage of these new tools. So, as a nursing leader, what do you recommend hospitals do to ensure adoption of the mobility tools and their applications? Well, the device and 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 the and the build itself have to be as simple as possible. And I think if, if as long as you don't disrupt that workflow and you build the process around the workflow, I think you minimize the, the, the changes that, that are affecting frontline staff. Obviously, it helps when the device is very familiar to staff and a lot of staff are familiar with Android devices. So it's very simple to use um, and, and it's been well uh, accepted by the clinical staff. Great. Thank you, Paul. Great information, great insight. And from you know, the person who's been in the trenches and rolled up their sleeves and got their, got their hands dirty. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Courtney Gavro, who's going to focus a little bit more on uh, measurement and some key performance indicators. So Courtney? 
Thanks, Bill. I just love to listen to Paul and the process that they went to, through. I really enjoyed how they focused on the clinician and their needs through the process as opposed to just looking at it as a technology that could be placed and give us a cool factor. And a lot of those decisions drive our measurements and our key performance indicators. So if you could go ahead and flip to my first slide. I want to encourage any of you who are looking at a clinical collaboration and communication project or purchasing a smart device to take a moment and ask your team what defines their success. Each stakeholder will identify different things. After you get your general list, then you can dive into how am I going to get an actual data point to show the reality of the gain? Because sometimes we look at gains for hospitals, and even personally when we buy something, we look at kind of intrinsic gains, and not necessarily something that's driven by value. So for example, for a cost gain, a smartphone like a Spectral Link, Versity, or Pivot is a tool that can house multiple applications. A wise CIO once told me, when you're measuring ROI for your project and you're considering a smart device, you need to look at how many applications will reside on that device. Then you can distribute the cost of the device over multiple projects. For example, just as an example in easy round numbers, if the device costs $1,000 and you have 10 applications on it, then you can distribute the cost and long-term cost of ownership across multiple functionalities. This may sound like a soft cost because you know, the reality is you're spending $1,000 per device, but when running an ROI on each project, you can actually judge the value a lot more fairly if you've distributed your cost effectively in that. After you get through the details of costing and ROI, you can move into metrics that have a broader impact on patient care, such as patient outcomes, caregiver satisfactions, and clinical quality and safety. A very simple way to measure effectiveness of purchasing an application like a Volt or like a Spectralink Versity or Pivot device that's integrated to nurse call is to measure it against HCAP4, which is your response to call light. Often we hear hospitals want to focus on measuring how long. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a meeting and they say, I just want to tell it, I want you to tell me how long it took us to respond to that or to deliver that medication or to do these things. But you're only looking at one leg of the stool in that scenario. How long should always be balanced with how often is the patient asking for assistance and how many times overall are they asking? This consistency and pattern is more effective in real-time measurement, but it also allows you to really impact change positively for the patient. We talk a lot about prescriptive medicine. Think about your prescriptive clinical operational models. How are we prescriptively taking care of this patient in the way the patient wants to be taken care of? This metric also feeds our quality and safety metrics around interruption rate. I get kind of tense when I go into a hospital and they're measuring things like alarm fatigue based on the initiated alarm. So how many times is that alarm going off? But we've spent hours and days designing escalation paths and not considering that the interruption rate is truly how many times is that alarm interrupting the care of the patient. And while it's important, so it's an important interruption, it is something that is taking to a moment to interact with. So those are the things I think very simply, there's a lot of things you can go into for measurement, but those are some easy things you can get to, kind of the low hanging fruit. And if you'll flip to the next slide, they all play into this concept called the real-time health system. So our friends at AnMed have stepped into this world. The concept's presented by Gartner Research, and in a number of papers, encourages hospitals to empower caregivers with situational awareness, mobility, and collaboration. However, Gartner points out that hospitals must enable a point of care, real-time data analysis to gain the value of the investment fully. Real-time data supports the concept of clinical knowing by bridging the gap between enabling mobility and enabling real sustainable gains, clinically, operationally, and ultimately those things lead to a financial gain. Hospitals across the U.S. are going through clinical transformation, where information is coming to our caregivers in real time, but we're stuck in the dark ages when it comes to measuring as we use retrospective paper. Now, some technologies are moving into cloud-based applications, but then you've still got a two to three hour delay as the information rolls up to the cloud and then is put into a dashboard. If you could flip to my next slide. When I first started working, hospitals would ask, where is this data stored and how do I get to it? Now, I'm proud of my industry. They've made huge shifts to get the data to become available. And now our new target as we work in our industry is, 
if the data is available, who owns it? And this is a common argument that I hear about, and really it's the hospital. They've bought the electronic device. They own the data to create a better environment for their patients and their caregivers. So as we work through that, hospitals are now asking me, what do I measure? Why do I measure it? And how will this make a big impact on my return on investment? I recommend that hospitals seeing hospitals stop seeing items on the smart devices as alarms or text messages or notifications and translate them into things that actually matter. Patient need, condition, engagement, and safety. I understand for many of you, the only way to measure alarms and texts and notifications is to count them and look at them as a quantity or a number. But the reality is that number translates to something incredibly important and valuable, and that's your patient experience. So how do you manage data in real time? Well, let me give you your first step. Don't ask for a dashboard. Many of you know that if you have a dashboard, you rarely go use it. Does, I loved what Paul was saying when he was talking is, I needed something that went into my workflow and didn't interrupt my workflow, didn't require something additional. So if you'll flip to my next slide. What we have identified, could you slip to my, flip to my next slide, there it is. At what we've identified the best way for caregivers to see data as meaningful information was to translate it into a visually understandable point of care tool that naturally infuses data into a common practice. For us, we leverage the practice of leadership and hourly rounding, and we align the alarm data into practice as a balance point to the patient's emotional feedback, thus providing a more robust understanding of the patient experience directly to the care team. I've seen other products, some are called clinical surveillance, and these are powerful tools that are watching all of the data points and then are sending immediate alarms to create visibility to a negative change in the patient environment. Those are powerful tools as well. If you're mobilizing your care team with a clinical collaboration tool, then you really need to empower them with visibility into the patient's behaviors and feedback. This goal is to take this goal is to take what you're doing daily and find ways to infuse real data and situational awareness. Now, once you put that real-time information into the hands of the caregivers, you can start through an evaluation process. And ours is pretty simple. We have four basic steps that you should do on a regular basis to hardwire behavioral change into your care team. First is evaluating technology. Is it serving them well and able to create the processes, changes that you want? Second, look at the processes. Did we train everybody in the ways that they should be doing and using the technology? And are, I always ask the question, is that serving you well? So is what you're doing on that technology serving you well? The next one is policy. And when you look at policy from an alarm standpoint, things we like to encourage people to do when they're looking at policy is, how can I empower my caregiver to make a real-time decision with real-time data? So for example, one of our hospitals allows the caregiver to change the settings, the default settings on the bedside monitor, then requests the doctor send in the order for change. And they have time frames and rules associated with it. It really empowers the caregiver to manage their own environment in a really effective way. And they know the patient's best because they're there all the time. The last one we address is behaviors because we have found nurses to be MacGyvers. They will work around anything that does not serve their patient well. And so what we hope is that with the behaviors that you're seeing, um, that they're reflecting the hardwired things that you want to have with your care teams. So with that, Bill, did you have any questions? I do, Courtney, and, and that's great information. I love the whole concept of, you know, that's not just a number because that really translates into, you know, patient experience. And it's not just alarms, but it's an alerts, but it's needs and conditions and very insightful. And uh, so for Nurse MacGyver, or Courtney MacGyver, right? Uh, question, mm -hmm. First question is, you know, how do hospitals really translate perceived value from their technology purchase into really documentable re rewards? Um, I think it starts at the beginning of your project. So if you start at the beginning of the project and you're designing the scope of the project and you're saying these are the values, these are the things I want to get back from my hospital, or uh, from my, my project, my new technology implementation, um, they can start at that point and then apply it going forward. I kind of, when we talked about this earlier, I used the example of we bought a Roomba and I thought that the value was that I didn't have to vacuum the floor anymore. Well, the value was I saved an hour every week because the Roomba was vacuumed. 
vacuuming all the time, in addition to the intrinsic values of um, having somebody else do it for me, which was just a joy. So those are the kind of things we encourage them to look for. Excellent. Uh, another question I have for you, what do you see as a difference between reporting and real-time analytics? This is a huge topic, and I think it's very important for our hospitals to start really understanding the difference between reporting and real-time analytics. Managing the care of our patients is a real-time issue. It's not a look at it a week later and then make an understanding or an assessment of what's going on. It's a real-time decision. And so by being able to see those things in real time, you can make an impact. I always use the example of Weight Watchers because if you're going to Weight Watchers, you don't just get on the scale once a week and say, oops, I gained a pound or oops, I, I lost a pound. You're looking at it in real time on your application on your phone. You're counting points and you're understanding how you are impacting your daily. So that's the other point of it is, if I've bought a smart device like a Versity or a Pivot, how can I give data back to my nurse in real time to let him or her impact the outcomes of their daily um, engagement? Excellent. And yeah, there's so many things that smartphones are measuring now. I was with a colleague and he measures his sleep every night just on his smartphone. So uh, it's real time. Uh, a third question yeah. I have. Smartphones seem to give that they give the clinician that real time tool to provide value to both you know them as the caregiver and the patient. How do you see this investment by hospitals evolving? Um, I see this as really looking at the patient experience. So real time data is critical for patient experience gain. Patients are individuals, and by nature, they want to be served as an individual. Um, we can make some adjustments in real time to that, um, but giving that information back to the caregiver. So even stepping away from the analytics for a moment of being able to communicate about my patient in real time, with my patient in real time, and with an entire team about my patient in real time, that can really drive some, some important change. But then if you have the data associated with it, then when I go into round on my patient, for example, I will know that my patient has called out for pain six times in the last two hours, and I know how to address them directly, or I'll know that my patient has been getting up out of bed unassisted consistently over the last two hours, and maybe I need to adjust, um, is this patient a fall risk or not? So that's how I see this tool. It, it's more than just being able to make a phone call. It's just like your smartphone that you have for yourself. My smartphone manages my whole life. Um, the smartphone in the hospital environment does the same thing. How true that is when you think about, you know, me measuring of HCAP scores that somebody calls you after you spent time in a hospital three weeks after your stay. And at that time, you tell them that you were your pain was not managed or your communication with your nurse was not exactly the best. And you've already been out of the hospital for three weeks. It's pretty much putting you know, the, the, the cart before the horse. So that's a big monumental shift. Um, so exactly. One more final question for you. Yes, exactly. So one more final question for you, Courtney, is how does all this, in your opinion, link to the patient experience? Um, the patient experience is a balance between satisfaction and safety. And hospitals are starting to look at it that way. This isn't just a, my patient feels good about their care. Um, if you try to measure or manage your patient experience based on a feeling, um, it, it'll be incomplete. And so when I look at how these devices and the technologies play into the patient experience, you're enabling uh, quality and safety drivers, bed exit alarms directly to your phone, um, critical, as I tell my nurses, we need to know our patients by anything that makes us run. So if I can have a visualization that I click a button and I say, it's showing me the patients that are making me run the most, those are those critical alarms that helps me to prioritize uh, my patient experience with them from a safety standpoint. And then, as we say, when you're getting this feedback, the verbal feedback from the patients, the emotional feedback from the patients, those items um, really have to be balanced with a behavioral metric. So for a simple example, if I walk into the room and say to a patient, have we been in to check on you every hour? And the patient says, yes, 
but I can see in the single visualization that the patients use their call light two and three times per hour, then I can dive a little deeper into the questioning. Or if I walk into the room and notice my patient is getting up out of bed, having a lot of bed exit alarms before I walk into the room, um, then I can go into the patient room and say, Miss Patient, I'm noticing you're getting up out of bed unattended. Are we answering your call light quick enough? Are you using your call light? Are there things we need to do differently? And that's helping us to craft and create the most um, personalized patient experience we can. We have all these tools, and now we just need best, better ways to apply them into making sure we're taking care of those patients. And most of them, you know, they're in the worst moments of their lives. So everything we can do to make their stay comfortable is what we should be doing. Thank you, Courtney. Excellent answer. And it, it, you think about it as a healthcare experience. It's almost like a travel experience. Everybody has that travel experience from health or you know the great one the same thing in healthcare and and you want to make sure that you avoid the ones that is the the negative side and more of a positive experience so with that that includes the, that concludes the formal portion of our presentation and conversation so i'm going to turn it now to some questions that we've received so thank you to the participants who've submitted some of the questions so i will uh I grab the question we'll submit it to uh our panel of three here and see if we can answer it so the first one uh, is from uh, David, and the question is, should healthcare systems allow staff to use personal mobile devices or a hospital-issued device? Paul, you want to handle that one? I'd be glad to. Um, the reason truly is HIPAA, and uh, we decided to go with hospital-based devices. I know this kind of ties into a couple more questions uh, down below about BYOD devices, and I can probably answer a couple of those questions as well, but uh, personal devices, uh, and we've had um, the older decked style Spectralink phones that uh, were not smartphones uh, originally. So staff would carry their Spectralink mobile phone that all they could do was make a voice call and they'd carry their personal phone. But as we stated about workflow and how nurses are actually MacGyvers and they're gonna figure out a way to produce a workflow that is most efficient for them, we would have instances where the nurse would take a picture of a wound. Now, obviously that's not a huge MTALA violation in itself because there's no identif identification uh, on the, the photograph itself, but they send that to the physician and say, you know, here's a wound of the patient. So obviously you get into the area of, you know, the, the dividing line between where you're actually violating a HIPAA uh, compliance issue or not. So uh, with the pivot devices, we are able to do those kinds of things all within uh, the HIPAA guidelines. So we can text uh, through the pivot and our full texting platform, uh, HIPAA compliant issues, name, room numbers, diagnoses, it doesn't matter. It's all secured uh, texting. And those are secure text within uh, our texting platform that go to BYOD devices as well, which is our physicians. Uh, we have um, the ability to BYOD for physicians, BYOD for leadership and management in the hospital, and then the spectral link pivots are at the bedside. So I hope I answered a couple of those questions at the same time. Something else, yeah, Bill, I if I could did, add yeah. to that. Um, sure. I've worked with a couple of Bolt hospitals, and um, that's the platform that they're using. And one of the things that's most appreciated is the flexibility. So if my physician has a BYOD device, the purpose-built device that the caregiver is using in at the bedside is, is really important to have something that has that mobility and flexibility between those two applications and ties the voice into everything. So if I'm in the application and I'm sending a text message, just like my telephone, I can hit a button and make a phone call out of it as well and have that conversation as well. We, we get in a world where we think the text is going to call it cover everything and I heard a, a wonderful conversation by one of my hospitals or one of the hospitals at HIMSS talking about how the voice communication is really important and I, I think that is as I've listened to Ann Med one of the things that I've seen that they've done very well is enable whatever type of communication I want to have as a nurse I can have with my physician in a safe environment and easy to use. 
And Courtney, that's a key point. I mean, we we run into that all the time with our nursing staff texting physicians uh, and talking about a patient. And if orders need to be given um, or they want to talk in person, all they have to do is hit one button and they're connected to the staff nurse taking care of their patient. Exactly. Thank you. Great, great answer. Uh, another question comes in from John and it is, have you considered using treatment teams in EPIC to drive assignments in Connexol via integration? I think that's probably something for an admin person. We are in the process of moving toward that. Um, my next step uh, for our platform is being able to, for the nurse to be able to make assignments uh, in EPIC and that flow from EPIC to Connexol. Currently, our process, our workflow process, which is fairly much the same as it was before, is that the secretary does assignments, only it has changed to electronic from a pen and paper, where the secretary would sit down and write out <clears throat> Nurse Smith, uh, room 406 to 412, um, and then their extension number. So instead of doing that, they go into Connexol and make those assignments for the shift, Nurse Smith, 402 to 406, whatever it is, and their extension is already there. Their extension remains with them all the time. But no matter what phone they pick up in the hospital, they can pick up any pivot phone anywhere in the hospital, and they log in, and they have their same extension that they always have. So once they're assigned that extension, it stays with them. Um, so in essence, I want to make sure that we even decrease the workflow uh, that's placed upon our ancillary staff as well. So hopefully we will get to treatment teams and we will have the ability to have PT and OT and respiratory therapy and the physician taking care of the patient as well as the nurse taking care of the patient to be a part of a treatment team. As they communicate with each other, they can do it through our texting system. Great. Sounds efficient. Uh, next question, this sounds like it's also for you, Paul, is what are your troubleshooting efforts? So do you work internally with IT or with the provider of your device? Uh, both. Uh, it, it depends on where we're at. We have sent our uh, part of our IT department to classes, uh, so they understand the SpectraLink product. They also understand the Volt platform as well as Connexol. So uh, part of our IT department has been trained in each of those uh, uh, hardware and middleware uh, platforms, so they understand it completely. Um, our process is that um, we have a centralized um, help desk, so that anytime there's an issue, it goes to the help desk. They basically triage the call as to whether it is a, a user problem, a specific phone problem, or a global problem, and then they advance that to the person that's on call or the person that's there for the day, who then in turn will either attempt to fix the issue or put a work ticket in with the with the um, the company that is responsible for that, whether it be Connexol, Volt, or SpectraLink. Very good. And then I have a question from James, and this is to both Paul and Courtney. It says, how do you ensure sustained, non-disruptive current workflow strategy when new and future technology enables workflow improvement? Um, you know, from, from my perspective, the way Paul did it was very effective. So what Paul did was he took, what am I currently doing today? He put it in place, and this gives him the opportunity to say, is current state, what are the measurements associated with current state, and then what small changes can I make to have big gains? Um, I've seen other hospitals do this as well, and I think it's important that your technology not dictate how you should do your clinical care. Um, the technology should enable and empower your care team. It shouldn't dictate how we should care for patients and care for people in our environments. The caregivers know how best to. One of the things I will point out that is a cool factor um, enablement when you have a Volt and a Connexol and a, a Pivot device, a smart device. Smart devices are very different in the hands of the caregivers. They're leaps and bounds ahead of the old uh, telephones that we had before. Um, is when you send an alarm to a nurse, um, we have noticed that the nurse will sometimes text. So she'll in it, engage the alarm and silence it at her device, and then she'll send a text message out to someone else 
to take care of it. And so it's important to say, I'm going to look beyond just the standard alarm measurement principles and say, what kind of texting policies do I have in place? Um, how do I make sure if a patient has used their call light or used some other form to communicate with us and we get a notification and we use the texting capabilities, how do I measure that going forward so that um, as we adjust our workflow and technology to leverage the new technology's ab ab abilities, um, we're getting the best results for our patients. And that really starts at the beginning of what are my core values, what are the key indicators of success for my team. And, and I agree with you, Courtney. And I think the, the piece of that question when it talks about enabling workflow improvements, I think if you take a workflow and you improve upon that or take a piece of that workflow out, it's going to be readily accepted by staff. And if it's less, if it's a, less of something for them to do, obviously I think it's going to be, they're going to adopt that. But I think importantly as well is the collaboration between IT and, and the clinical side. And that is when you're looking at any device or software, hardware, middleware, whatever that is, I think somebody needs to be making sure that they ask the question, you know, is HL8? I'm just making that up. I mean, is there something new around the corner? Is something new being looked at? I mean, do, are we going to buy a device or a software or middleware uh, that is going to be ensured that it's compliant with whatever new technology is coming forward? And I think you have to have some forward-looking aspect to that to make sure that you have the IT folks who are knowledgeable and keep on top of that so that when you do purchase something or look at purchasing something, you have that 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 ability to move into whatever the new uh, design is. And that's why I think that the spectral link devices are actually really great because they're built on a platform that is being used across industries. And so if you have, have that type of platform with that type of flexibility, the hardware investment is secure and it allows you to make the good decisions on your software investments. And really you can start asking yourself some really great questions of how is this software enabling what I want to achieve and what is the value over a period of time? What's that value look like for me? So I think that AMED just did a fantastic job of empowering caregivers. So I can't encourage everybody enough to engage their care team the way that AMED has done to make their project very effective. I agree, Courtney. Thank you for that. And then uh, we have one more minute, so time for one more question. And one of them came through was uh, how much time or how much training is needed in a typical mobile deployment? And, and I'll tackle that one. And, and thank you for that question. And training is a critical component of adoption. Uh, I used to be in the training business years ago, and we used to say if you think training is expensive, consider ignorance. And the fact is, if you don't provide that guidance, if you don't do the whole tell, show, let, try, observe, and give feedback, the, the person is not going to feel comfortable with the new technology. So I think the amount of training will depend. Uh, it depends on a few factors. I think it depends on the level of experience the users already have with mobility. Have they already been using the mobile device within the hospital, but now this is an upgraded device? Or do they have familiarity with an Android or they've been, have they been using iPhones? There's a little bit of difference. Yes, they're intuitive and, and that, but it depends on also how many uh, other integrations you have. So the second major component is the number of integrations, the number of applications involved, and how do you handle that in terms of your workflow? And then also really just so the, the level of accountability, if you will, to actually use the technology. So if you train them and you expect them to adopt them, but nobody's following up to see if you're actually using them, nobody's following up to see how do you like it, then you're really gonna go back to what's comfortable. You know, again, nurses are gonna focus on what is the best thing for their patient. And change is always difficult. And so, you know, making sure they have hands-on experience. And then finally, I guess I would recommend is make sure you have a super user that can be on site to provide that that training and, and that support ongoing. So, and, and the only thing that, I would add, yeah, sure, Bill is is I know it's it's kind of common sense, but make sure that you have ongoing training for your orientation. Our nursing staff development, we have three super users for all our our processes, so they, they're able to teach that in orientation, which is also something to keep in mind. I know it should be obvious, but yep, agree a hundred percent, Paul. Thank you for that. So with that, I believe we're at the top of the hour. 
Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Becker organization as well as the folks who joined me, Paul Hubbard and Courtney Gavro. Really appreciate that. Uh, and of course, to the participants who joined in on this webinar to learn a bit. Hopefully, we gave you a couple nuggets to walk away from. This re this recording or this webinar was recorded. So if there are colleagues that you believe you want to share this with, you can do so. Uh, and then, of course, our contact information here from uh, SpectreLink is there on the screen. So look forward to having conversations with you down the road and uh, have yourself a great week.